Welcome. Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you all for being here today. At this time, I present our Master of Ceremonies of this event to you. Welcome, Melanie Ake. Melanie Ake is the founder of Everyday Leaders Professional Coaching and Consulting, a certified John Maxwell team leadership coach, speaker, trainer, and as a certified Y Institute agent, she helps others discover their own why. Welcome, Melanie Ake, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Gigi, and welcome to all of our panelists today. This is a wonderful event, one of very many that we've been doing to host people that are recovering and becoming champions in their life. This is the Global Virtual Panel of Recovering Alcoholics event, and we are so excited to bring you speakers to encourage you on your journey. Gigi Sabat, you are the host today, and thank you so much for bringing all of us together. You are a motivational keynote speaker, two times best-selling author, life coach, first generation Haitian American, the host of Walk With Me podcast on JRQ TV, financial expert and CEO and founder of Life Service Center of America, LLC. We are excited tonight to bring all of these wonderful panelists together. I will be emceeing this event and giving you lots of statistics along the way. So stay tuned, get your journals out, and we're gonna kick it off with our first keynote speaker, which is Kellen Flukiger. He's the author of 13 books with numerous bestsellers, and he's known and coaches international clients and businesses on inner work and high performance all over the world. Welcome, Kellen, and thank you for sharing your story and your journey with us tonight. Well, thank you for having me here. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with this panel, and I appreciate the work, all the work that Gigi has done in putting together this and many other panels, all aimed at the betterment of people's lives and their lots in life. <clears throat> Today, we're focusing on recovering from one particular addiction, one particular compulsion, which is alcohol. As all of you know, that's not the only thing that is a barrier or keeps us from achieving our maximum potential. Alcohol is a poison. It is a chemical. It's no different than any other substance or any other activity that keeps us from living into who we really are. So today, my purpose is to share with you a little story and mostly to talk about recovery, opportunity, possibility, and future. Everyone has a similar story about getting into addictions. Disappointment, depression, struggle, defeat, abuse, harm, negativity, all of those preceded that. Myself included, I had 40 years uh, with depression, mostly untreated, with the stigma and all of it attached to it, married to the idea that somehow I wasn't good enough and never would be no matter what I did and no matter what I tried. Now, the funny thing about that is I had a fabulously successful career, made a ton of money and had all kinds of high powered positions. But behind the scenes, I was broken depressed, convinced I was no good, and lived constantly from that place. As no surprise, I turned to substances. Alcohol was very high on the list, and it was a huge problem for me for years. I hid it. I lied about it. I pretended it away. I spent money I didn't have. I ruined relationships and all the rest. But those of you listening that have either lived with or had those problems know exactly what I'm talking about. And the details of your story are going to be different, but the outcome is going to be the same in that phase. The next phase is a choice that we make. Is it time to change? We live with our problems until we make a firm declaration to change, and then we get the help we need to support that effort. Sometimes, often, that is Alcoholics Anonymous or some other recovery program committed to those who are making that effort. But the most important thing is two things. Number one, a firm personal commitment to change, and second, to allow God the creator and designer of your gifts, your talents, your ultimate destiny into your life in a way that lets you be directed and you open yourself to that direction. So wherever you are on your journey, what I want to talk to you about right now is the next chapter. 
wherever you are, if you're just starting your recovery, if you're one year into it or 20 years into it, I'm in the middle of that. I'm probably ah, seven or eight years. And I've attended some meetings where people stand up and they say they've got 20 years sober, which I used to not even be able to imagine. The key thing is what are you going to do next? Because quitting alcohol or some other substance is just the beginning. You're a divine being with gifts and talents. You have the capability to lift and bless others. And in fact, one of the things I talk about all the time in my coaching practice is achieving your ultimate life. And those are just so many words, except I give it a certain definition. It's a life of purpose, prosperity, and joy that you create by serving others with your divine gifts. Leaning into that chapter, discovering those divine gifts, making choices one day at a time to serve, to look for opportunities to lift. I have a phrase on my wall that says, I live each day as a beacon of light, a vessel of love, and a conduit of power to add good to the world, because our destiny isn't to get by. Our destin destiny is to fearlessly and joyfully imagine and create and serve every person we talk to. My challenge to you today is to go through tomorrow and the next day. In fact, try for a whole week and have the commitment for every interaction you go into to leave the person one step higher closer to God, one step up the emotional ladder, one shade brighter, just because they were in your presence. You can do it. You have the power. It's a choice and it's a state of mind. Recovery is possible. Far more is your destiny. Serving, giving, loving, adding good to the world. We need it now more than ever before in the history of the world. You can do it now. Thank you, Kellen. Thank you so much, Kellen. What a challenge for everybody, right? You can do it. I think the power of this movement is that we need to take responsibility and through God, we can change our lives. So thank you again, Kellen, for all that you do, for all that you're sharing, and we appreciate you. Uh, if you're watching thank this... You. If you're watching this on the panel, if you've joined us here live, please ask your questions in the chat as we go, and we can connect you to everyone and answer your questions. Um, so here's some key facts, right? When we're talking about this as a movement, worldwide, 3 million deaths every year result from harmful use of alcohol. This represents 5.3% of all deaths. And this is a causal factor of more than 200 disease and injury conditions. Now we think every single time that we know someone that is affected with alcoholism, that they can just change overnight. And so we wanna to listen to all of these panelists, their struggles and their victories and celebrate them. So next we have our panelist that's going to share her story, Cassandra Seidenfeld. She's a professional actress, humanitarian and an athlete. She was the recipient of the 2016 Women for Empowerment Global Medal of Honor and her work empowering young women and girls, survivors of human trafficking in the US. Cassandra had an international modeling career and co-built a novelty company from startup to major leagues. Among her many interests, continually giving back, Cassandra is dedicated to supporting women's mental health issues and she actively serves on several national boards Welcome, Cassandra, and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Wow, I'm just blown away. We have one life, and that life is precious. You are a gift and a treasure. Thank you all so much, awesome hostess Gigi and fellow panelists, for this amazing opportunity to share our collective thoughts and experiences on such an important topic. Most of us love having a good time. And good time is associated with good food, wine, good company, and fine spirits. There's a fine line between enjoying libations and being overtaken by libations. I had two very close extended family members struggle with alcoholism. The signs were very similar and the circumstances somewhat different. 
The first was more of a peer, very successful, high functioning individual with an incredibly thriving retail business. The first signs were mumbling, stumbling, which can happen to anyone, right? After a long day into a celebratory night. The subsequent signs were, for lack of a better word, more unique or noticeable. And they were symptoms that ranged from loss of memory, severe loss of speech, symptoms that we, 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 we recognize today to no sense of reason. At first, this could sound like the person is like the life of the party, but a closer look and you can see that these are signs of danger, signs that someone needs help and that the substance is overtaking the faculties of the being and clear signs that we can intervene and help. The second instance occurred when a family friend was staying with me. He stayed for a few days and we shared dinners together, good conversations. Periodically, he would like disappear from the dinner table. At first he said he was going to the loo and as the evening progressed, he would disappear without mention for like really extended long periods of time. My assistant came to me and shared with me that evening that he was constantly grabbing glasses of wine or vodka from my butler's pantry. And as the evening progressed, he was barely physically making it back to the table, let alone being coherent, but more jovial and bouncy. Yet he eventually passed out in my study where he rested until the next morning. We made him a nice breakfast, got him you know, prepared to leave, said our goodbyes. I stayed home most of the day and I asked my assistant uh, if she had seen him leave because I noticed that he had forgotten a bag in the guest room that he was staying in, which of course he did not sleep in because he stayed in my study. She said to me, no, he hadn't left. And I said, hmm, that's kind of strange. So we began to search my home and didn't face, didn't find any trace of him for like an hour. After some time, we noticed in the guest bedroom that he was supposed to be staying in, that the covers were slightly, you know, changed from the way that they had been made. He was hiding under the bed. I love both of these people dearly, and I'm sure you love anyone, particularly anyone who is suffering and is, pain, and is in pain. And in both cases, both people needed professional help, and we helped them get to AA and retreat clinics. Their paths were not easy promises were made and broken, ultimatums ensued, and after much love, prayer, dedication, and commitment together, we saw these challenges together as like a community and a family, and they sought the help that they needed. One recovered patient has been sober for over two decades, not a drop. His company sold for over a billion dollars. The other has remained mostly sober with the constant love and support, continued love and support of the nucleus of the family and the professional encouragement. Life knocks us down and we each have different coping mechanisms, regardless of what drives us to vices such as non-recreational non alcohol. We need to love, support, and encourage those that we care about who care about us. Please take great care of yourself and each other. Listen with your heart look from within your soul and help heal from your essence. We are love, we are stronger together, we got this. Thank you so much and God bless you all. Thank you, Cassandra. Thank you, Cassandra, so powerful, knowing these stories are affecting all of us in our daily lives. It's just maybe one person away, right? What we do, uh, how we react to that and how we can help support. Appreciate all that you do. Thank you for sharing today. So alcohol poisoning is serious, uh, sometimes deadly, right? So consequence of drinking large amounts of alcohol in a short period of time can cause alcohol poisoning. Drinking too much too quickly can affect your breathing, your heart rate, your body temperature, and your gag reflex, and potentially lead to a coma and death. It's so important that we look for these signs as we can help other people in their journeys. Stephanie Epstein is our next speaker. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. She is a transformational life coach and founder of Your Highest Heels. We're so glad you're joining us tonight, Stephanie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so grateful to be here. And Gigi, thank you for making this possible. Kellen, thank you for getting us started. Melanie, thank you so much for your service. And I am just grateful to be here and to be sober because it truly is a miracle 
a miracle and a gift because alcoholism is a disease to me and I didn't choose it, but I did have a point in my life where I hit a bottom and there was divine intervention is what I like to call it because I did not have the power to stop on my own and I needed help and I needed other people. And I'm just here to share my heart today and share my experience, strength and hope of where I was to where I am now. So I've been sober almost seven years. And in those seven years, I would have never imagined that all of the things that have transpired in my life would have happened. If you would have asked me the day I got sober, write down 10 things or even five things that you would like to happen now that you're sober, I would have, I would have sold myself totally short. I mean, by so many, so many degrees. And I just, I have a wonderful life today because I'm sober and it wasn't, I did a lot of work around my healing and I believe that when we put in the work and I'm also in a 12 step program, when I work the steps and put in the work that I can have a beautiful life and not every day is easy. This doesn't mean that it's easy. Life is still happening, but my life is so much more beautiful and my, my vision of my life is so expansive. Like I'm not living in this tiny world anymore. I don't feel enclosed and trapped and stuck and lost and a feeling of lack. And the feeling that I feel whether I was drinking or not, I felt a pit in my stomach 24 seven before I got sober. I really believe I was an alcoholic before I even took my first drink and that I was susceptible to this disease. And so, it has allowed me to see the truth about my disease is that I'm powerless, not only over like the alcohol, um, but I also am powerless over that feeling. Like I, I felt that pit and the power that I needed to overcome that was a power greater than myself. And I like to call that power God. And that is my higher power. And I really believe that my higher power surrendered me. It was almost like I didn't even surrender when I decided I almost like it wasn't even a decision really to get sober. It was a decision to once I got sober to continue the journey, but I almost feel like I was surrendered by God. So I couldn't be more grateful for the life I have today. And now I want to pass that on, pass on you know, the darkness that I went through is now my biggest asset because I can pass that on to other people. And I've created a business where I'm able to give people hope and use my experience to help them realize their fullest, like their potential and the big life that is out there and that you're not alone, that you don't have to go through this alone. There is help. There are people. Look at all of us today here. I, I know that you know, I don't know every single one of you personally, but I feel a connection. And that is the most important thing because I believe this is a disease of separation and that we need connection, um, especially for me, whether that's from God or other people, I need that to nourish my soul and to nourish myself. And so um, I just want to say that, you know, just to give people hope, I have a beautiful life today with beautiful relationships. Nothing is perfect, but um, I get to be a sober mom. I'm currently pregnant and um, it's just such a gift to give that to my child, to give that to other people and to create a business where I work every day, um, passing on the experience, strength and hope. So, so grateful to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Wow. Highest heels, but highest hopes, right? You're amazing. Thank you so much and good luck with your pregnancy. This is wonderful to celebrate that with you. Thank you for sharing your story today. It's very, very powerful. Yeah. Alcohol use in the United States is 85.6% of people ages 18 and older reported that they drink alcohol at some point in their lifetime. So it's this trigger, right, that we're going to continue to learn about and what changes, what makes you become an alcoholic versus someone else. Uh, today we have our next panelist, 
I am so proud to introduce her, Emma Stoll. Um, she is a wife, a mother of three, a former teacher who lives in Pleasant Point, New Zealand. Since early childhood, she's dreamed of writing stories that would capture readers' hearts, but life got in the way of dealing with abuse, PTSD, and drug addiction, and she turned down her scholarship. Soon after she dealt with the addiction and got clean, she became a teacher and then a mother. She had three children, and then she realized that she still had a dream and experience that she could draw from, from to write an amazing story. She specializes in breaking contemporary romance boundaries, combining mental health, poetry, and romance. Her novel, Beautifully Broken, is the first hashtag good girl, hashtag bad girl trilogy. It was based on experiences with abuse, PTSD, and drug addiction. And it's all becoming yourself and staying hashtag beautifully broken. Welcome, Emma. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, I just want to start out with uh, my own journey. So uh, five years sober um, and before the five years sober, I was 13 years sober and I really thought within that 13 years sober, that was it. I was done. I was clean and I wouldn't have to deal with addiction again. Um, so I spoke in another panel about suicide um, overcoming suicide and so um, 18 years ago it all began when um, I'd grown up with addiction and parents and other people around me who were alcoholics so it was very easy to fall into that life without even really realizing that it had happened kicked out of home um, living in a horrible flat where everyone else was doing drugs and drinking and an abusive partner the day I was lying on the floor after he'd beat me up and made me lose our baby and I just prayed to God and said, if you're out there, you need to get me out of this situation because I won't make it. I just knew in that moment I wasn't going to make it. Three weeks later, I'd met my now husband, I'd moved across town and I'd applied for college. Um, it was still a long journey from there and it wasn't. I made the decision to get clean, but it wasn't so easy as walking away from that life, especially because I allowed myself to still drink occasionally. And that was all fine until five years ago when I had two young children and I looked at them and suddenly all the abuse that I'd suffered when I was a young child came rushing back. And I'd seen some abuse as well of young children and I was just thinking, how can someone do this to a child? And the images in my mind were just burning in there. And I started to drink to forget. Um, and one day I remember just sitting there with a bottle of Jim Beam over the day, sneaking a little bit here, sneaking a little bit there. And I got through the whole bottle and suddenly realized mm -hmm. I'm back where I started 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> and... Um, yeah, I just suddenly clicked that I had to get sober all over again. And this time I had counselling for PTSD. I also started writing my book, Beautifully Broken, about dealing with, uh, so it's a romance, but it's about dealing with addiction. And people have said to me, the character drinks. How can she be a recovering alcoholic and she drinks? Um, but that was my first experience. And I'm currently writing Beautifully Breaking, which is where she becomes an alcoholic again. And it's getting in that mindset because other people don't always understand the mindset, the things you tell yourself when you're drinking. It's not your ordinary mindset. Your mind goes somewhere else and you easily talk yourself around to drinking. And um, it's not as clear to other people that you can just walk away from it. Um, but I just want to end with my brother's story. So... He started drinking around about 12 and um, I just kept praying for him and I kept going to visit him. I didn't en enable his drinking or his drug addiction, but I just kept praying for him, staying there for him. Two years ago, so from 12 to 33, he was on drugs 
he became clean and he hasn't touched a drop in two years. So he was homeless, um, drug addiction for yeah over 20 years and he became clean. So you can always come back from where, however low you think you've gotten. And that's what I want to just say, you know, never give up on yourself and never give up on anyone that you know that also suffers from addiction because it can be done. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Emma. How encouraging is that about mindset, right? We can all do that. We just need the resources yeah. and the community to be able to help us. Yeah, Thank exactly. You. Congratulations. <laughs> I can't wait to read your books. So in transitioning here, if anyone is needing help at this time, the National Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Association has a hotline. That phone number is 1-800-662-HELP. That's 4357, 1-800-662-4357. That is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. This is a free, confidential, 24-7, 365 days a year, treatment, referral, and information service. It's in English and Spanish for individuals and families facing substance use disorders. Our next panelist is Dory O'Neill. Dory, thank you for joining us tonight. You are a life purpose coach helping women to identify their dreams and explore what's next in life. Her personal experiences with alcoholism and recovery, surviving an abusive relationship, and letting go of self-destructive behaviors were the catalyst for self-exploration and healing. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Dory. Thank you so much for having me, Gigi. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be on the same stage as you, always. You're such an inspiration. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I am Dory O'Neill. My sobriety date is October 30th, 2012. I had my first drink at 15 years old. In the first moment I had that drink, things changed for me. I was no longer the scared, insecure person that saw themselves as ugly, fat, not worthy. I became the life of the party. I became where I could speak my mind and I became all of a sudden this beautiful, gorgeous person that in my mind that I thought I should be. Along with that came all these different behaviors and all of these different actions. And you know, that's what a lot of people talk about sometimes when they think about alcoholics, they talk about the bad behavior of an alcoholic. Did you see when they did this? Did you hear what they did? And that became very much so for me. I was a, a blackout drinker almost from the get-go. And if you can imagine waking up the next morning and not remembering what happened, nothing. I would wake up and I would go, what did I say? What did I do? Where am I? Where's my car? And did I drive? Go into my garage door, slowly opening the door to see, is my car out there? And if so, is there any damage? That's the life I lived as an alcoholic, an active alcoholic. But what I wanted to talk to you today about is shame and the illusion of shame. We all have shame in our lives. As an alcoholic, I can say that my shame was, was pretty, it took me out. I would do shameful things when I drank, only to wake up and find out all of the things that I did all my friends would call me the next day. Oh, guess what you did last night? And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I always had a saying, if I didn't remember it, it didn't happen. And um, we would just kind of chuckle about it. And then sometimes I say, I just don't, please don't tell me. Please don't tell me. I don't want to know. Because that shame would cause more shame, which would cause me to drink more. It's an illusion. Shame is an illusion. And I'm going to tell you why. Because as you start, when you get sober, there's all of these people around you who've been through similar things. And we don't judge, we love. Shame likes darkness. It wants you to be alone with your disease and it wants you to be ashamed so you don't talk. And when you don't talk, you don't heal. 
And that's what it wants from you. And so what I'm here to say today, it's an illusion. And even as you get sober, there'll be a lot of people, shh, don't talk about it. Don't tell people what you are. That's an illusion. Because what happens is that I'm giving back freely what was given to me, freely. And I'm here to help. We're all here to help. All of us that are panel on the panel today are here to help and offer every bit of hope and joy that we have. But just know that shame is an illusion and it's time to shine the light on it. Step forward, take a hand of one of us that's here or someone that's offering to help you. Take the hand. Don't be afraid. Speak your mind, speak up and find the joy and get help. You can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Dory. Thank you, Dory. You know, uh, I pulled up some statistics and it looks like here from 2019, there was a study done and it says binge drinking in the United States. It's one in every four people, one in every four people ages 18 and older reported that they had engaged in binge drinking in the past month. So you look around your friends and you think one in every four people, that's a high statistic. So we want to be cognizant, right? And if we find people in our lives that are involved in this to reach out and see if they can be helped in any way. Our next panelist, excited to have you here, Sparkle Lindsay. Welcome to this panel tonight. Uh, Sparkle is an influential speaker and addiction coach. She's based in Colorado Springs, Colorado. We're so glad that you're joining us to tell us about your journey tonight. Yes, thank you for having me. I just want to say thanks, Gigi, all of you guys. It's always good to be around my sober warriors, so I'm glad I can see that. Uh, you know, I am two years sober as of May 4th, 2021, and I am extremely excited to be on this panel, and I'm just blessed to be around a bunch of great people right now who are willing to stand up and talk about what this addiction is doing to all of us and how we have overcame it. So thank you so much. So I will start with my story. Uh, I am from Colorado Springs, Colorado. I am 36 years old and I am a keynote motivational speaker, an author, and I also am a recovery coach for alcohol and addiction. My journey has been pretty wild. Uh, I started out as an athlete. I have a wonderful family. And uh, I was an athlete who worked really hard. You know, I got my, my degree, everything. In that time, I got really sick and I wasn't sure how or why. And uh, in that, I ended up in a wheelchair, uh, six to eight months and everything came crumbling down for me. At least I thought everything. Um, I was told I'd never walk again. And I said, would never play another year of college ball. And uh, I never cried about it. You know, I never really cried. And I knew I was gonna walk. So I just kept doing what I had to do. I retaught myself to walk, played another two years of college basketball and had an opportunity to try out for the WNBA. And I did, and I turned it down. And one of the major reasons why is because I was so blessed to be able to walk again. But in that, I never cried and I never felt those emotions. I never felt what was actually going on with me. And I jumped into being a manager, a, a human resources manager for three big box companies for 13 years. And for me, it was, it was so exciting. I was able to fix everything, help people do what they needed to do. But once again, I was not helping me with what I needed. And before you know it, things got kind of rough for me. I, partied a lot. I drank a lot. I was in a lot of pain for my autoimmune conditions. And right around the end of my career there uh, in corporate America, I had an associate kill himself in front of me. And uh, uh, I lost it. You know, I had trauma. Um, till this day, I worked through this trauma. Thank God I worked through the trauma. But a big piece of it was me being able to realize that the accolades and everything that I had accomplished were great, but I didn't even know myself. I had no clue who I was and that scared me. And so I went on ahead. I had an opportunity to get a promotion for work. I turned it down and I went to get treatment. And when I went to get treatment, I thought I was running the place. I thought I was good to go 30 days and I'm good. And before you know it, I had my first breakthrough 
I had tears. I hadn't cried in 13 years. And the tears put me into a somatic stroke. And so all of this work, I kept thinking in my head, all this work I'm doing, and all I had to do was cry and feel some emotions. <laughs> I went through all of this just to finally start living now. And all along, it was all about what I had to find in me. And so with that, uh, you know, I wrote a book called Being a Better Me for Me. And that book is simple tips and tricks to help me be better for me daily. So I thought others might wanna take that on as well. And so with that, I help people walk alongside getting sober and I help them figure out where they fit in their puzzle because we all have a puzzle we fit in and we all have this specialty to us that we have to find, but we have to give ourselves time to do that. And so during my journey right now in this two years, I have found that there is so much available. You know, you've heard some people say seven years and five years, and I am right here in this enlightening spiritual awakening. And I can't do anything but look forward and hope for the best. I do say that out of everything I've ever known is that there was a person who held my hand and said, Sparkle, I got your back. And if you need me, I'm here. And I knew then that I would forever help people help themselves get sober and keep myself sober as well, knowing that I have sober warriors around me all the time. So if you are someone who's just kind of struggling or you just need somebody to talk to, we got a lot of us here that can just kind of talk to you, walk with you through it and help you know that, you know, you are worth it and you are deserving of whatever it is you want it to be. So throw it out there, believe in it the manifestation will happen. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Sparkle. Thank you, Sparkle. How can you not sparkle when you listen to Sparkle? This is, you're amazing. <laughs> I just want to call so you and talk cool. to you. <laughs> you really lift everyone up. And your journey is so important to remember. It can happen at any time, no matter what life has brought to us. And we can make that decision in one moment. It can be taken away. So uh, we love that you're helping and pouring into other people. And you're such a great coach. So thank you for showing up today yes. and helping us. You're amazing. <laughs> So this is an impact for the world. Economic burden to the United States for alcoholism. In 2010, alcohol misuse cost the United States $249 billion. <clears throat> That's an impact. Our next panelist is Titus Nakagawa. Facebook and Instagram ad ninja, <laughs> uh, visual effects artist, funnel strategist and builder, agency owner, micro influencer, hard money loan broker, video editor, creative consultant, and sensory deprivation, float tank enthusiast, and mental health advocate. Welcome to our program tonight, Titus. Thank you for sharing tonight. Aloha. Um, I want to say mahalo, Gigi. Um, and everyone up here, I really appreciate you guys having me. Uh, this is legit the first time I've ever talked about my sobriety. So I'm just going to kind of roll with it. Um, and I'm going to start with my journey. So it's a little different than everyone who spoke so far. But I started drinking in the seventh grade. So I've been sober for 15, almost 16 months. And this is the longest stint I've ever had since the seventh grade. So um, I relocated for college. Uh, I quickly got into the F&B industry and that immediately translated to drinking. Um, once I realized that I could make more money in the nightclub district, I decided to switch over. So with the nightclubs came heavier drinking, um, more blackouts, but a lot more money. Um, and this money kind of fueled my habit because sick people hang out with sick people. So this pattern of me drinking heavily while I'm working on top of going out and drinking and throwing money at the people who came to throw me money uh, really repeated itself for half a decade. Um, on top of that, I was throwing club events and throwing concerts where I was the center of attention, the big promoter, uh, made a lot of money, but still everything was focused around alcohol. So 
as I transitioned out of the nightclub industry in my early 30s, um, I was an extremely, extremely functional alcoholic. Uh, I worked a corporate job for a startup. I did really well, became very successful at it. While at the same time, I'm probably drinking a bottle of Jameson every two days on top of entertaining clients, having cocktails, and, you know, I went through the whole, I'm a connoisseur of sake, I'm a connoisseur of wine, I'm a connoisseur of whiskey, um, which made me feel classy as an alcoholic. But throughout this entire time, I really was oblivious to the fact that I was as deep as it could have been. Um, just for a little, little morsel of knowledge, I was having a conversation with a friend the other day and I told her about one night that we went on drinking for a bachelor party. And I told her throughout the course of the night, we probably had close to 30 shots each on top of cocktails throughout the night. Uh, no vomiting, no alcohol sickness, none of that. I just became a complete obnoxious, fun little clown running around. But for most that would send someone under the table and potentially to the hospital and that's how bad my sickness was. So fast forward a little bit. Um, I went through what Richard Rohr calls the dark night of the soul. Um, I had a very un, unfortunate series of events, which honestly led me to sobriety for the first go around, which lasted about a year. And it also led me to God. Long story short, I had a failed business, diagnosis of a sick mother. Uh, I had a girlfriend attempt to kill herself in front of me. Um, and I got into some legal trouble. Um, this is DUI number three, one of which that I got convicted of. So I eventually found God. He is my higher power. Uh, I'm rooted in him, but my sobriety didn't last very long, maybe eight, nine, 10 months. Started having one a week, then it led to two a week, then it led to two, two times a week and so forth and so forth until I was hiding a bottle of whiskey, the Costco size underneath my kitchen sink, finishing that in about three days. So here's the piece of hope guys. Uh, for Lent last year, I just decided to quit. I was gonna do it for 40 days for obvious spiritual reasons. Um, and it worked. And at the 40 days after Easter, I was like, hell, might as well keep going. Um, and what I realized is that I, I live and exist with some mental health issues. I'm type two bipolar. I live with type two bipolar, just like I live with alcoholism, even though I don't drink. Now the words there, ladies and gentlemen, are very important. It's not, I am, I live. We can rewire our brain. Our neuroplasticity can change just by the words that we use. So nugget number one, I want you to take that home. I live with not I am. Fast forward to Easter again. Uh, my mental health started to take a turn for the better. Uh, my mania and my depression slowly started to fade. Once I hit about seven months of sobriety in this run, that's when the light went off. So typically with bi bipolar, type two bipolar, you have short high swings and very low long downswings. I'm talking like eight to 12 months of depression. Now it's a cycle that I need to live with, but when my cycle was due, it never came around and it still hasn't come around. It's been like nine months of joy and peace, which I never experienced in my entire life. So to initiate a little bit of hope, make your mess your message, tell more people, the more people you tell, the easier it gets. Do not label yourself in any way, shape, or form. Say that you do have to live and exist with X, Y, and Z. Talk to everyone. Talk to anyone that will listen. And hey, you just might help with your mental health problems, which in all honesty is the core issue for most of our alcoholism. Uh, but mahalo, guys. Really appreciate your time. Thanks for having me, Gigi. You guys are the bomb. Uh, I hope to do one of these in the future. Um, but with that, I bid adieu. Aloha. Thank you, Titus. Thank you, Titus. What a strong, powerful story. Um, wow. Congratulations on your journey and just becoming who you are, right? Um, 
You're amazing. One thing that I wanted to touch on in my notes here, I thought it was really important listening to Titus, thinking about people that judge others of going through your journey. If you're trying to make an addict feel shame, it's not going to improve the situation. Instead of lowering their self-esteem and confidence, motivating them to quit is, um, you know, it's really hard. So alcoholism needs the proper treatment, just like Titus said. You've got to surround yourself with the right people and, and us that are not alcoholics trying to help with those, those processes. Um, making the situation worse with careless behavior is not the best option. So being able to get help for yourself so that you can help others. Our next panelist tonight is M Maria Rodriguez. She's a certified fitness and nutrition coach at Girl Code. Fitness and nutrition with M Maria Rodriguez. Welcome, Maria. Hi, everybody. My name is Maria Rodriguez, and I am so grateful to share the stage with you. Thank you for having me. Um, I was, you know, I can I can go way, way back, but I'm going to start in the point where I was first introduced to alcohol and, and how my journey started. Um, I was, I, I, I vaguely remember, I was maybe like seven years old, and my father was an alcoholic. And I did not know he was an alcoholic until, you know, I would see his eyes bloodshot red and all these things that he would do when I was younger. I saw them in my adulthood, you know, just reminiscing and having memories. And I would think, wow, he was an alcoholic. And I didn't think much of it because I grew around, I grew up around it. So I just thought that was normal. And in the Hispanic culture, they consider, you know, Hispanics to be heavy drinkers and they consider that to be normal. Unfortunately, that's, that's what a normal came to me, you know, that's how I saw it. And when I was 13, I was invited to um, parties and I will go and I was introduced to alcohol and I started drinking at the age of 13. Fast forward to when I was 25, I was in the early stages of alcohol addiction. I felt like I couldn't go to work and have fun if I didn't have alcohol on me or I was consuming it. I also found myself also surrounding myself with a lot of people that, you know, as a previous speaker mentioned, you know, they black out to their drunk and that's just normal. And I realized that I was being hungover every single day. And I did not like that feeling because I questioned myself, you know, is this how I want to end up? One of my ex-boyfriends committed suicide due to alcohol and drug addiction. And that's the moment I knew that I needed to wake up and I needed to get out of that, um, that, that tunnel where I was headed because I, if I wouldn't have never snapped out of it, I would have never, you know, been here to share my story. So, you know, two years ago is when I, I woke up from that nightmare that I was living on and I decided to just make that move, not just for myself, but for my children, because I would see how, you know, friends, there was an acquaintance of ours that he drove drunk and he crashed onto a pole and he died in his best friend's lap. And I did not, I did not want to end up like that. That's not how I saw my life um, ending. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to make that change. And at first I felt like there was no ending or there was no exit out of this tunnel. I felt like I was never going to be able to, you know, stop feeling like I needed that to have fun. But I, I prayed and I, I look for support groups. Unfortunately, people looked at me as weird because they were like, you're not an alcoholic. Alcoholics are usually, you know, they look trashed and they look messed up and, and they look like they've been beat down. And I was like, that's what you think that's, that they look like. But if you catch yourself looking to have a drink every single day or two or three or four and two just turns into five, then you might need some help. And if your circle doesn't understand you, feel free to reach out uh, to somebody, to a friend that you trust, because you shouldn't wait for you to look beat down or run down in order to ask for that help. Um, so with that being said, I just want to share a little bit of, 
positivity into your life. Maybe you're watching this and you're thinking, well, I drink, but to have fun. But do you really need to drink to have fun? How many does two turn into? Does two turn into drinking all day? Because if that is the case, then you might have a problem. But there's other people like you, like me, that are willing to help you and that are willing to guide you and not shame you or, or make you feel bad for being in the situation because at the end of the day, we're humans, we fail and we learn from our mistakes and that's what matters. So thank you so much for having me on the stage, Gigi. I appreciate you, all of you. Thank you. Maria. Thank you, Maria, very much. Uh, it's so important to remember all of those things um, as we, as we kind of go through life, we gotta take our responsibility, right? So congratulations yes. for living your journey. Thank you. Thank you so much. Titus talked about this and several others, so I wanted to touch on this again. The symptoms of alcohol poisoning, signs and symptoms. They can include things like confusion, vomiting, seizures, slow breathing, which is less than eight breaths a minute, irregular breathing, which is a gap of more than 10 seconds between breaths, blue tinged skin or pale skin, low body temperature, or passing out. So if you have any of those signs, if you are with friends or family and notice these, um, this is when you want to call a doctor, right? Because alcohol poisoning can cause a fatality. Our next speaker panelist is Sinitra Robinson. She's an international best-selling author, passionate about helping unhealthy reptiles and people lose weight. Springingscales.com is her website. And is Sinitra here with us tonight? I just, uh, yeah, she is. just saw, there you go, Sinitra. Hello and welcome. Hello, hello, sorry. I was just like, what's going on? <laughs> I was trying to get my um, my background to, to do it, but I guess I'll just roll with this. So um, thank you guys so much for having me on here. Uh, Maria, it's good to see you. Gigi, it's good to see you guys. So yeah, um, about 11, I wanna say about 12 years ago to kind of start with my journey, um, I actually got really, really, really drunk and I fell down the stairs and actually broke my ankle. Um, I was so drunk that I didn't know where I was. I didn't know where, what happened. I, I did not know what was going on. Um, and thank God, you know, I, I didn't know God then, but I know God now. And he was right there with me when I, when I, um, when I was in the hospital, when I was uh, hobbling around trying to figure out where I was. And I was at home when I did this and I, I was outside, I guess, going to a friend's house and it was really terrifying for me. And uh, that was the point where I was like, I need to really wake up. I need to do something for myself. So about, that was about 11 years ago to fast forward. Um, I moved here from Portland, Oregon to uh, San Antonio because my parents were, um, you know, they were, they're alcoholics too. Um, I love my parents still dearly and I love, all my family, I just, you know, it's something that happened. So I was, um, I was, uh, I, I moved here to, from Portland, Oregon to San Antonio to start my life new and fresh. Well, when I um, went to the altar and asked God for forgiveness and asked God for help, um, it was a really, really good thing. So now I, I wrote my book, it's called The Power of Knowing and Loving Yourself. Um, it's something that I did because I really hated myself when I first started when I first lived here, um, I did go back to alcohol when I first moved to Texas. I didn't have anybody in my corner, but like I said, I knew God was with me. I just didn't know him. So once I started realizing that I needed to do something for myself, I actually did something for myself. Um, I started helping on healthy reptiles. I wrote my book. My book just came out about um, three, I want to say about two months ago. So I'm selling those. It feels so good to get my story out there. Um, and there's some things in here that I actually talk about, like really uh, fear, uh, how to get over your fear of snakes if you're terrified, the power of saying I can and will, um, the power of eating well and clean, the power of not being worried, the power of sin and don't let that get you down, um, the power of really loving yourself. And, you know, um, there's just some things in here that that will help you get over some of the things that you need to get through. 
always grow and always grow and believe in yourself, believe in what you can do. What I did is I wrote my name in the mirror and it says Sunitra. So it's like, you know, um, uh, stylish, you know, talented, athletic, you know, um, cause I was a 13 year gymnast. So I'm always so hyper, but it really came down to me and doing what I really wanted to do. This little guy here, he's a bearded dragon. I've had since 2008 and he came with me from Portland, Oregon. And then I started helping more reptiles. And then this little girl here, she actually has a bone disease. She has a molecular blood bone disease and I rescued her. I have 21 reptiles. So I've, I've got a lot of different animals that I've, that I helped. And, um, you know, it's time to get over your fear. And I hope, you know, people get over your fear of reptiles or whatever you're going to going through. I'm the overcoming fear coach and uh, I'm Sunitra. So thank you so much again for having me. I, I appreciate it. I'm glad I can tell my story. Thank you, Sunitra. Wow, Sunitra, I've never heard of anyone that is healing reptiles. I love this. Uh, <laughs> this is awesome because it is really, we're all connected, right? It's God's universe. So uh, what a wonderful way to explain fear. Thank you so very much and congratulations to you. Thank you. You know, we've talked a lot about drinking at a young age. And so I wanted to bring this up, remembering if you have a teenager, talk to your teenagers about the dangers of alcohol including binge drinking, like we've heard from several panelists, evidence suggests that children who are warned about alcohol by their parents and who report close relationships with their parents are less likely to start drinking. Our next panelist tonight is Susan Pierce. She's the host of Eden's Living TV, radio writer for Christian Media, certified electromagnetic radiation expert, raindrop therapist, biotech pharmaceuticals, and now naturopathic life coach. I love this. Thank you, Susan. Naturopathic. Yeah. Yes, naturopathic. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's kind of crazy because I had something prepared, but listen to y'all, the Holy Spirit just kind of came on me. And the, I am from Jackson, Mississippi. I am a naturopath. I'm ex-pharma. And I had a five-car polyp. I was in bed for from 1995 until like eight years ago, y'all. I, I never got out of bed. I got up to 267 pounds from all the prednisones. I was a legal heroin addict. I was taking Oxycontin and my mom and dad passed away. And my brothers and sisters that were my half brothers and sisters, they first of all fought me over inheritance. That was fun. And they left my life. And I found myself in a bed with a cat completely alone. And I was listening to everybody's story and I was like, I heard post-traumatic stress. I heard assaults. I heard self-love problems. I heard um, guilt and shame. I think in healing and recovery, first of all, you have to come to a place where you just go, I surrender. I surrender. I can't do this by myself anymore. And I remember calling to God. It's like, I don't want to live, but I'm a Christian. I can't kill myself, but laying in the bed from, you know, 20 hours a day popping pills, there's no joy. There's no touch. I heard about community was important. Community is huge in recovery. You need to make people feel that they are loved, that they are seen, that they are needed. And I think you just love people where they are. I tried to recently uh, help a young man. He was a vet and he saw his best friend blown up before him and he came to work for me and I started noticing he had to go in the bathroom a lot and I was like what is going on and then I found beer cans on my property and I told him look there's two rules with work with me I'm a life coach nine years sober you respect my sobriety you don't bring drugs on my property and you don't drink on my property and you don't come on my property because you don't realize it guys you open up portals there is a spiritual component to getting sober there is a higher power and that you have to tap into and that higher power I realize is like I can't heal I've been in this bed for 20 something years I'm hopeless I'm alone I'm with the cat I have no touch I'm fat nobody's going to touch me and I found God and it was amazing because that spirit comes in and it just rests on you and when you get in that spirit you realize that you can love yourself 
And I just love you guys. I'm thankful for y'all. Thank you so very, very much. We all have a story. We all have a story. Love yourself enough to get us over. You can do it. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Right, we have to make goals. We have to be yep. accountable. And so uh, some of these that uh, I've researched here, just is a couple of reminders that can help everyone. Set goals and prepare for change because you are going to have to change. So once you've made the decision to change, the next step is establishing those goals. So number one, when will you stop drinking? A quit yes. date. Establishing the quit date. And then um, limiting your drinks to certain days of the week to cut that down and then establish that final quit date and get some accountability partners, right? So gosh, thank you guys all for sharing so much this evening. And our next panelist, Erica Castro. We are so excited that you're here with us tonight. You are a teacher at MUSD, domestic violence, sexual assault, and suicide attempt survivor and advocate. Thank you for joining and sharing your story tonight. Hello, hello. Hi, I'm Erica Lopez Castro. Um, I'm talking to you guys today about my story in recovering from alcoholism. Um, I grew up in an alcoholic home. My father was an alcoholic and I despised him for his drinking. And my alcoholism didn't come till I was age 35. Um, you know, I thought I escaped it. I thought, you know, I'm not an alcoholic. I would have been an alcoholic in my 20s or when I was 25 or something. But no, I became an alcoholic at age 35 when my husband fell in love with somebody else and I couldn't understand or take the pain. And I turned to alcohol. And I was a binge drinker. So I would drink on the weekends. I would, you know, I was high functioning. I would, I would still go to work. Um, but one of the biggest things that I that would happen was that I was not present emotionally. I wasn't present, um, you know, with my children. I wasn't present um, as, you know, as a mom, you know, as, as anything. I was just lost during those times of my drinking. And I did go to an outpatient rehab and I was sober for four months. And there was another time I was sober for nine months, but I just could not stay sober. I would always revert back to the alcohol and revert back to the alcohol. And um, and what did it for me was I had a suicide attempt because I was drunk. And that was kind of my way out beginning. And I, I still couldn't stay sober. I would, I would keep drinking. And so finally, um, I finally left the relationship that I was in. And I had to be the responsible adult and I got ourselves an apartment and and I finally at that point I made a decision that I needed to stay sober because who was going to take care of my kids who was going to provide for my kids. I started going to meetings. I started working myself in the program. Um, you know, you can't do this alone. I'm going to tell you, you cannot do this alone. You need help. You need support and being loved by the people around you. And I had already participated in other 12 step programs, but I, I knew that I needed AA for, as my foundation. And so I really worked on staying sober and I've been sober seven years now. Um, and there's things that I'm really proud of. You know, I have a four-year-old who's never seen me drink. I have stepchildren who's never seen me drink. I have a granddaughter has never seen me drink. And I know when I feel like drinking, I know now what to do. I know to go to a meeting. I know to call somebody. I know to get out of my head. And the worst thing you could do is to be alone and isolate. When I tried to kill myself, I was isolating. I had tons of friends I could have called, but I chose to isolate. And so there are people out there who are willing to be there for you and help you. But you can't, they can't help you if you isolate and don't let anybody in. And that's, that's how I stay sober. I've been sober for seven years. Whenever I feel like I want to drink, I don't, I know my, my brain is crazy. My brain will tell me, oh, you can have one alcohol. You can have one drink. It's no big deal. So when I start thinking that way, that's like my trigger. 
that's like my my little ring in the bell saying hey you need to go to a meeting you need to call someone you need to stop thinking crazy and that's how i've been able to stay sober and i'm so grateful i'm so grateful because i understand my father and the pain that he was going through because that was me and so you know for those of you who have family members that are alcoholics i say go to alamon get help for yourself have patience have love because they know what they are because i knew what i was and I didn't love myself. So just try to be patient, but go get help for yourself. And eventually, with God's grace, maybe they'll get sober. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Erica. You are always an encouragement. Everything that you do, every time you speak. Uh, you know, one thing I want to remind people of tonight is that it's different for everybody. Right? Your treatment and your options and your healing is different for every single person. So there's no magic bullet. There's no magic process. You have to own it. Donnie Starkins, thank you for joining us tonight. We're excited to have you here and hear from you. You are a yoga instructor and a personal development coach. Thank you for sharing with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is such a, a great platform and it's an honor to, to carry the message. This is what it's all about. So again, my name is Donnie Starkins. I'm a yeah personal development life coach. I teach yoga and I teach meditation. That wasn't always the case. Um, today, I'm grateful I have eight years sober, but the one important part of my piece, uh, the part of my story is that I once had three years sober, but I ended up going back out. And I, and I share that piece of the story. It's the best thing that ever happened to me today because it reminded me that the work will never stop. I had three years sober and things were going well, but you know the deal. Like I stopped doing the things people do. I stopped going to meetings, stopped working the steps, stopped being of service. And I ended up hurting my knee. So I've had seven surgeries on my left knee. And that's where painkillers is a big piece of my story in addition to alcohol. But painkillers is almost maybe a little bit bigger, but to me, it's all the same. But having those three years of sobriety and stopping to do the work, I had a surgery and I woke up from the surgery and I love the way that I felt. And six days later, I had um, went back to the doctor and was lying about the pain. And that sent me into another relapse. And I'm that for the relapse went for about nine months. And, and again, today I have another eight years on top of that. But I always share that because, yeah, in losing three years of sobriety for a while kind of buried me in guilt and shame and, you know, having to start over. But today it's the best thing that ever happened to me. And through this practice, yoga and meditation is such a huge piece of my own recovery because I believe in the mind-body connection and that our issues are in our tissues and that the body remembers everything. And I do believe the 12 steps offer so much, but the one little piece in my personal opinion that's missing is the body, the movement, moving stuck energy and, and knowing that our, our body holds on to the trauma and the guilt and the shame. So to be able to have received yoga. My mom used to, so she's the one that got me into yoga and she always used to say, you need to do yoga. And I was like, you know, in my addiction, dying physically and spiritually. And I would always tell her yoga is for girls and hippies. I'm not doing that crap. Like that's where my mind was at the time, just so fixed, right? Such a limited mindset, no growth. And finally I did it one day and I love the way that I felt from a physical standpoint, but little did I know what it would do for the mind and the soul. So then I just started, um, I went to teacher training, started teaching it. Um, today I get to I get to teach it, I get to coach. I work with a lot of uh, professional athletes. I co-host a, a, a podcast called Comeback Stories with Darren Waller from the Las Vegas Raiders, who is public about his own sobriety. And so we tell comeback stories and they're not all recovery based, but it's just a reminder that everybody has a comeback story. But I just wanna really reiterate from a mindfulness, like the, 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 the powers, like the, the superpowers we get from this mindfulness practice. One I always say is like zooming in. So zooming in is all about focus, right? It's the ability to ignore distractions. What we practice grows stronger. And if we have a practice of focus, we don't get sucked down those roads of all the distractions being thrown at us out on a daily basis. The second one is zooming out which is perspective. It's that ability to take a step back and see the bigger picture, knowing when it's time to let go or move on, we move on. Um, the third is the pause, the power of the pause. You think about how many of us like 
ever said something we regretted or sent that email, right? The pause allows us to have space to make better decisions, to make less mistakes, and to realign our actions with our core values. And then the fourth one is really the ability to change channels. You think about your TV or your, your mind is like a TV with all these stations. Some of them are informative and some of them are just crap. So it's just this ability to select our thoughts so that we're they're empowering thoughts and we don't get sucked down the, the negativity. So I just feel like if I were a doctor um, that like had a cure for cancer, I would be on a mission to, to share this message with as many people as possible. And that's how strongly I feel about mindfulness and yoga, especially when it comes to recovery. It's like, for me, the missing piece, and that's where the passion comes from. And it's just a blessing to be able to, to share it with the world. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Donnie. Thank you, Donnie, the power of the pause, right? Everybody needs to know that. Uh, a great, great visual on that for everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight and sharing your story and congratulations on your podcast. That's really great things that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for having Absolutely. So I wanted to touch on one thing. Erica mentioned treatment facilities. And so there are four different ways that you can receive treatment if you're suffering um, through alcoholism. So the first one is a residential treatment center or partial hospitalization intensive out um, outpatient programs or therapy. So group therapy, family and individual, and it's a community service. Our next panelist here is Lee Shetsky. We are excited to have you here tonight. You're a certified life coach who helps people reach freedom from alcohol so they can write their life's new story, one not defined by alcohol or the past. You help people who want to stop over drinking as well as people who've stopped but are still struggling to abstain. You teach your clients a better, sustainable way and one that doesn't rely on willpower. Thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, thanks so much, Melanie. And thank you so much, Gigi and everyone and all the amazing panelists. I mean, the nuggets that people have been talking about you know, so many similarities in all our stories, even though every one of our paths is unique. Um, yeah, so I'm a certified life coach. I specialize in helping people find freedom from alcohol. And I think the biggest thing that I want to let um, attendees know is that there are many options that are available now that maybe not didn't used to be available. So like personal private coaching is one of them, in addition to all the options that are out there as well. Um, a little bit about my story. So my entire family has been affected by alcohol, parents, siblings, nieces and nephews. Um, one of my brothers committed suicide a few years ago. Um, my family was Catholic, so growing up, alcohol was readily available in the house. And I think I started experimenting with alcohol in grade school. Um, I started looking for help in the 90s, and I just wanted to drink less at that time. I looked at traditional step programs. I looked at outpatient rehab. At one point, I even tried hypnosis, and nothing seemed to work for me. And so again, I continued to progress drinking. I was working full time, hid it from everyone. No one had any idea, um, but I did my did my drinking did progress over the decades. Um, finally, when I stopped in 2018, I was up to drinking a couple of bottles of wine a night, um, passing out, suicidal. Same thing. I'd go into work, and no one had any idea um, where I was. And we a lot of panels have talked about like the isolation and the shame we feel, and that's definitely where I was at. Um, the coaching model that I found, I actually found after I had stopped, so it was in 2019. And what I really love about it is it really helps um, helps people release those lingering negative feelings, the feeling of shame, of judgment, um, limiting beliefs. Releasing that is huge. Um, another thing it can help is again creating a new story looking forward where it's not about being limited by the past. And again, it's not about relying on willpower to abstain. Um, that's just miserable, I know, because I tried it. <laughs> um, and I think the thing that I want to add, um, little nuggets for people that they can take away if you're looking for help, is that the circumstances and situations around us are neutral. It's really our thoughts and feelings that we have that are running in our, inside our head. That's really what's creating the strife in our lives. And so part of what I do when I'm working with people is helping them get curious with themselves and explore everything and it's without judgment. So getting curious and asking questions and just exploring. And so some examples of those questions are like, how is this thought that I'm thinking serving me or not serving me? 
another one that I love is what am I making this situation mean about me? Like what's going on out in the world that's neutral? What am I making that mean about me? Um, another one is how can I let this be easy? You know, so many times we, we struggle, you know, a lot of us have talked about struggling with our own thoughts and struggling with our own feelings and realizing we have the power to release that and bring the agency back in our lives. And that's really where we can create that future looking forward. And so I think that's the message that I would love to give the attendees is that help is available. Um, people have talked about making that decision to reach for help and to reach out, find someone that can help you. You have an entire panelist here with amazing experiences and perspectives. Um, you know, any one of us would love to, to help you if, you know, if you message us, if you're looking for help, help is available and you just have to make the decision to say, yes, I just want to help and I want to talk with someone. And so thanks again. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. This is a really, really great um, journey of you helping and pouring into others now. Yeah, you reminded me that treatment really should address more than just alcohol abuse. It's the whole community, um, really your whole well-being and examining everything in your life. And so it is a step and the coaches are so important in this process um, in our community. Thank you very much for sharing your story tonight. Stefan Neff. Uh, you are an anesthetist, best-selling author, speaker, show host, and alcoholic in recovery. After studying medicine in Heidelberg, Germany, you traveled and worked in Europe and Australia before settling down with your family in beautiful New Zealand. As a retired pain physician, you developed a specific insight into human psychology. And as a man trying to drown your sorrows, you found that the hard way that the critters can swim but over the last seven years, you've made every day a little bit better than yesterday. Today, you're an expert in living life so fantastic that alcohol has simply no role to play. You share your passion through your podcast and YouTube channel, Into the Light, a different life story. Your book, Steps to Sobriety, you share your lessons that you've learned as a doctor and as a man. And the truth is simple. The past does not equal the future. Every addict can turn his life around, one little decision at a time. Your books and your show, and they show how to do it. Thank you for joining us tonight. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be on this, this panel with you guys and to just share the reality of alcoholism. Alcoholism is, is something that we that is out there. One in three people over the lifetime will use alcohol to escape reality. And they use it in such a way that they uh, just drink far too much. Now, what is too much? That is often a good question. So, because one of the things that alcoholism does to you, it convinces you there's nothing wrong with you. That's a hallmark of the disease. So what is an alcoholic? What is drinking too much? Well. It's simple. Some, an alcoholic is someone who drinks more than his doctor. Now, if I was his doctor, I, you have to beat me for quite a bit because I was a busy boy. I mean, alcoholics, we are busy. In the morning, we hide that we were hungover. Then we hide that we're thinking about the alcohol the whole day. Then in the evening, we are hiding that we're buying the alcohol. We go to different shops pretending that it's just for the special offers. Then we are hiding that we're drinking. We're hiding that we are drunk. And then we can't remember that we are hiding and then we wake up again. And that is reality. So guys, if you hear something like that, such a story and it rings a bell, hello, hello, welcome to the club. You either do suffer from alcoholism or you are an alcoholic, whatever is more palatable to you. Uh, it is important that you realize that. And it's, there is nothing wrong with that, okay? It's, we, we somehow are written by these twins of guilt and shame and we put ourselves down constantly about it oh my god i have drunk oh my god i sent that email drunk oh my god for crying out loud do you think that an asthmatic will have the same shame that he said oh my god i had an asthma attack how dare i bullshit a, a diabetic oh my god my blood sugar is high yeah, you, you, are, you are worthless. You need to be in jail because your blood sugar is high. No, it's a disease and you can treat it. Alcoholism is the same. It's a disease. It has very clear symptoms. And unfortunately, many of us have them. 
are you an alcoholic? Simple, ask yourself the following questions. Um, have people recommended you that you should cut down on your drinking? Have you been angry that other people have actually uh, talked about your, your drinking? Do you feel guilty about your drinking? And lastly, do you from now and then need an eye opener, i.e. do you need to drink actually in the morning to, to steady your, your hands? Well, if you say two or three of them, yes, or even four as it was for me, then welcome, welcome to the club. You have got the diagnosis, you're an alcoholic. So there are many, many excuses that we make. Oh, I'm, I'm a converser. Oh, no, no, I, I, you know, it's part of my job. There, there's so many, many good reasons why we do drink. The problem is it's a false friend. And we guys who have been in the dark hole, we know about that. The problem is you're not just drinking for the beautiful taste. That's rubbish. You're drinking because you want to escape reality. You want to escape your life. And that's really where the underlying reasons are that you need to have a damn good look at. And that's where recovery really comes into its own. To just stop drinking, well, that's white knuckling it. Uh, that's, that's torture and it will not last. You need to address why you're drinking. You need to address the PTSD, the depression, the nasty things that have happened into you, in your life. And this is not a pissing contest. This is whatever it is for you. Your friend doesn't have to be blown up into little bits in front of you in order for you to have PTSD. Um, you might just deserve that you take a closer look deep inside and try to figure out what are your demons and why do you want to escape the life that you're living right now? Because only then can you actually say, well, okay, fair call. Let's throw this alcohol to the wayside and let's actually focus on the positive things. May that be yoga, may that be religion, may that be you getting into sports, may that be all these beautiful other little steps, those micro habits that you start establishing in your recovery, which suddenly turn your life around. It's not just that one big miracle that one day happens. No, it's tiny little steps that you take, but in a consistent way down one route, you are you're dreaming what you want to be, who you want to be. And then out of that dream, you create a vision, you make it really clear. And out of that vision becomes a mission because you want to take little steps towards that. And by the time you've blinked, you're halfway there. You're that new person and you've forgotten, oh shit, I didn't drink anything. My God, because you're actually living such a beautiful life. You're out there, you're living it. And that is recovery. That is what my addiction showed me. That is where I nowadays say, why the hell would I numb myself when I have actually this beautiful life to live? But it doesn't come out of blue. You have to work, you have to work at it. You have to create it. And guys, you can do it. Because if I can get my act together, honestly, you so can you, okay? So there are ways out there. Just it's okay not to be okay, but it's not okay to not ask for help. Go out there. There's so many people out there who are willing and who are able to help you and have done so much worse than you ever have done. So guys, don't give up. Stay strong. Look after yourself. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you so much. What a great reminder that we have to make that choice, right? It's okay not to be okay, but we've got to find help. And so I want to tell you, congratulations for writing your different story. You're amazing. So things to remember, right? Five steps to a sober lifestyle. And every single one of you have touched on this. But there are notes that I've taken here. So first is take care of yourself. The second one is to build your support network. Third is to develop new activities and interest. Four, continue the treatment that you're on. And five, deal with the stress in a healthy way, just like what we've heard tonight. So thank you all for joining us. This has been amazing as our panelists here. We are now going to our sponsors. The sponsors of this program support every piece 
of GG's summits. And this is amazing because we have a great network uh, of panelists that are supporting each other as well. Um, the first one is Lakeisha James. Lakeisha James is here behind the scenes every single time, corporate event planner, set designer, mentor, author, and Atlanta chapter of Leader of World Women Conference and Awards. Lakeisha, thanks for joining us and helping us do all these amazing things. Absolutely. I would not be any place else. <laughs> to the panelists, all I can say is, wow, you guys are amazing human beings. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Because like I say all the time, everyone has a story. And if you impact one person, you've done your job. So kudos to you guys. I'm praying for you. And thank you so much for sharing your story. We appreciate you. Um, I know we have, we want to recognize the other sponsors. Not sure if they are here with us uh, in the back room. Um, Ragni Sinikas, founder of World Women Conference and Awards, uh, Women Entrepreneurs TV, Changemakers Coach and Public Speaker. We also have Michael Butler, I see him here, uh, CEO and Be of Beyond Publishing, book publisher, global speaker and media coach. Welcome, Michael. What a great event. So many great speakers. And I'm just reminded of how precious and amazing life is. And you guys have really blown my socks off, as you always do. Gigi, what a great event. And Melanie, great job hosting. You've given a lot of reason for people to find hope and keep moving forward. So keep up the good work. I'm proud to be a sponsor and my camera's not working today, but you know what? Everybody's mics are working and that's so beautiful from across the pond to down under to all over the U.S. and around the world. You guys are really making a difference. So I'm tuning in and uh, applauding you and can't wait for the next event. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Great to see you tonight. Great to hear from you tonight. <laughs> Um, our final sponsor, uh, Daniel Gomez, keynote speaker, corporate trainer, executive coach, confidence architect, and author. So thank you all for your sponsorship. And uh, I would like to turn it back over to Gigi now tonight to close out our program. Yes. Wow. Thank you, Melanie. I appreciate you. Each and every one of you today, absolutely amazing. Such powerful stories. And you all are truly someone else's hope for the folks that are listening in today. And now they know they too can overcome. And so I wanna start off by telling you all that being aware of your behavior and actions is so important. And once you are aware, then you can change your behaviors and actions. And remember, you have the ultimate choice to make the decision to transform your life. You can transform your life today and beyond. And if you need additional help, reach out for help. And again, the number Melanie Egg shared earlier today for, during this event is 800 help. You can transform your life. Always remember God is with you wherever you go. We seem to have had a technical issue there. I believe we're all still there. Melanie Ake? Yes, you are all good. Um, yes. I'm still yes. here. And I was just saying, lastly, I was just saying for everyone to remember to never give up and keep going no matter what. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Lakeisha, would you please uh, close us in prayer tonight? Absolutely. Absolutely. Father, in the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Father, for this day that you've made the world sealing and rejoicing in it. We thank you for everyone that assisted on this panel, Father. We thank you right now for giving them the voice to share their story. We thank you right now that the past does not define our future. And Father, we're going to continue to lean on you, Father. We thank you right now that you have your hand on us through this journey. We give you all the honor, the praise, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. God bless you and be safe. Thank you.